Good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome to Uniting Church Sketty, whether you're here in person, joining us on Zoom, or we'll perhaps see YouTube in the week. A very warm welcome to you all. And if you're here, please join us for refreshments in the Wesley Room afterwards. And there are also nice things to buy. And apparently, we have to eat lots of chocolate. I think it needs eating quickly. So feel free. It's a good excuse. Sad news this morning. Um, Paul Evans contacted me early this morning to say that his sister Nicola died last night. Um, he was with her. She'd had a very short illness and was in Morriston Hospital. She would have been 57 this week. He's asked that for the next few days that you don't phone or visit. Um, but then I'm sure afterwards he'll be glad to hear from you. So we remember Paul, Nicola's husband, and Peter and family as well. Um, also this week is Kath Davis's funeral. And I've been asked to remind you that the family said you do not need to wear black. You wear what you are comfortable and happy with. That's at three o'clock on Friday. Um, notice from Alan, there are some seats in the walkway, two seats. Um, please try them out and see which one is the most comfort more comfortable for you and to tick in the relevant place on the piece of paper that's there. There is lunch, church lunch in, Hain, in um, not Hain, there when, Black Boy. There is lunch in the Black Boy after the service, even if you haven't signed up, feel free to go. Um, there's quite a number of people going, so hope a few more will attend. And now let us stand for the Bible as it's brought in, if you're able to do so. This morning we welcome the Reverend Simon Walkling, who is the minister in Christwell, but also regional minister to support URC churches in our region. It's good to have you again, Simon, and we're pleased Sue could join you as well. Welcome to you both. It's God, please be seated. It's God who said, let light shine in darkness, who shone in our hearts to give us the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus our Lord. So we begin with continuing our liturgies for Lent. This liturgy was written by Louise and has an ecological theme. The words will appear on the screen. Please will you respond with the words which appear in the bold type. Jesus of the shadows, Christ of the scars, familiar with sorrow, acquainted with grief, suffering with this suffering world beside us in our pain. We have fractured the planet, tend our wounds, and mend our brokenness. By your cross and your life laid down, lead us on the paths to life. Pilate spoke to them again. What do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. Pilate asked them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Mm -hmm. 
Jesus, your crucifixion could have been avoided had Pilate acted on his convictions and let you go? Had the crowd shown compassion? When the system fails and love seems drowned in a tide of hate, when forests burn and communities are deluded and your people have nowhere to lay their heads, give us courage. and call for justice. Transform the policies of death, and may your voices and protest and hope sing through the dissonance and lead all creation to life. Amen. Jesus of the shadows, Christ of the scars, for the sake of our aching world, help us to follow you. Amen. Those litanies and prayers and the build-up of symbols around the cross have helped to mark our journey through Lent so far. Today is also St. Patrick's Day. It reminds us of a British missionary who, um, at the age of 16, was captured and taken as a slave to Ireland. And after he escaped, he um, connected up with other Christians in Ireland and then went to, to train uh, uh, as, a, as a minister and a missionary in Gaul and then came back to build churches in Ireland to, to challenge the, the kind of um, localized kingdoms with the good news of Jesus. His prayer Today I rise and bind God to me has been set to music and, um, and made into hymns by various people. And the version we're singing today was written by David Fox. David was a United Reformed Church minister. He served in various places in Betus, in um, uh, near Newport, he served in, in, in Hollywell in North Wales and then in Penarth and he was also the Synod Clerk for, um, for uh, the Wales Synod of the United Reformed Church. He was brilliant at baking biscuits, at sewing, at uh, making banners and at hymn writing and he disappeared suddenly on a walking holiday in Slovenia in 2008. And there are people around who still remember him and still miss him. But we are going to sing part of his legacy, which is one of his hymns, Today I Rise. And uh, I hope the words will appear on the screen and you'll be familiar with the tune.
Please be seated and let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray. Living God, like the Celtic saints, we pray that you will encircle us and that we may be aware of your presence. Help us to know that there's nowhere we can go that you haven't been there before us and that wherever we are, you are with us. Encircle us round with your love, your peace, and fill us with joy and hope. Each morning, help us to remember that you are with us and to live as though your presence is with us and within us. As we put on our clothes, as we prepare for church, as we arrive today, Help us to put on compassion and kindness. Help us to see ourselves aright in relation to other people and to be humble before you. And over everything, help us to put on love. Fill us with your love and may it flow through us that we may show your love in all that we do and say and live in your love all the days of our life and beyond giving thanks for your love revealed in Jesus and in his name we pray Amen I'm going to see what we can remember about some of the bits of Jesus' life. The cross and the symbols around it have highlighted certain things, but I want to ask you some questions. So, um, you're not gonna be able to answer if you're on Zoom, I'm afraid, but, uh, or on YouTube afterwards, but you can be praying for the people here that they know the answers. Okay, so, you'll have to shout out. Um, where in the Gospels does Jesus or the people around him hear a voice from heaven? Baptism. Baptism, Baptism of Jesus. Heaven's open and a voice comes, this is my beloved, my, my son. Anywhere else? Transfiguration. Transfiguration, spot on. This is my son, listen to him. Good. A couple of places, we don't need to make a whole list. In the Gospels, what kind of predictions does Jesus make about what will happen to him in Jerusalem? It's too long to shout out, isn't it? So, um, what kind of things does he say? The Son of Man must suffer, die, yeah, they get a bit more graphic in some of the Gospels. They would be flogged, rejected, beaten, mocked, scorned, spat on. Yeah, the, the, there's a sense through the Gospels, just as we have made with our cross and our liturgies, a sense of this building up, Jesus being on a collision course with the authorities. And when does Jesus wonder if there may be another way? Sorry, Pat? Garden of Gethsemane, yes. And sorry, you were saying you were saying the garden too. Yeah. And I, I guess we could also say in the temptations in the desert, he's tempted to think about following another way. And he overcomes that. But in the garden, he says, if it's possible, may this cup pass from me. Um, okay, so different times in the gospel where there's assurance from God's voice, there's um, an awareness that something's coming, and there's wondering whether there are other ways of achieving, showing God's love in a non-violent way. Kerry is now going to read to us from John's Gospel. And some of those things are going to appear here. Um, 
but it's not in the places that we're used to hearing them. Jesus has just been welcomed into Jerusalem. The crowd that saw Lazarus raised has followed him and are waving palm branches. Um, he's entered to Jerusalem, and this passage just comes at this point. So listen out for the things we've talked about, but also listen for the other things that appear in this reading or that we hear about in this reading. Kerry, thank you. So this is from John chapter 12, and I'm reading verses 20 to 33. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. Amen. Thank you, Kerry. So John doesn't tell about Jesus' baptism in the same way as the other Gospels, but the voice comes from heaven to um, say that in Jesus, God is glorified. The passion predictions of Jesus' suffering and death don't come in the same graphic way as they do in the other Gospels. They're more in the way of metaphor. Unless a grain of wheat die and be buried, it can't raise, rise again to, to bear fruit. And um, Jesus talks about being lifted from the earth um, to indicate the kind of, kind of death he is going to die, being lifted up on a cross. It reminds us back to um, John 3, where he compares it to the bronze snake that's lifted up in the wilderness to, to heal the people being bitten by snakes. And John uses a particular way of talking about glory, the, the suffering and pain and, and death of the cross is described as, as Jesus being glorified. For those who want to see Jesus, this is where who Jesus is, is most clearly seen in his giving of himself out of love for the world. And 
John doesn't tell of Jesus' anguish and thinking about a different way of doing things in the garden. In the garden is a prayer, prayer for his followers, both then and now. Pray that we might be one, that the world might believe. And that's appropriate as we gather as a uniting church. John uses the word glory to describe the crucifixion, a contrast of what people knew to be the real pain and suffering of the cross, to talk about it as part of revealing God. Our next hymn is written by Brian Wren, a United Reformed Church minister who did a lot to bring contemporary language into worship, but also did a lot to make the issues that Christian Aid was campaigning about um, real to, to people by designing games and, and sharing them and helping people understand what it was like to be a farmer in the third world. And he also wrote hymns, and we're going to sing one of his hymns, which is how, describes how the people who saw Jesus on the cross might have thought of him, a man discarded, uh, um, uh, somebody who's, who's been discarded by the authorities, but also somebody who's failed in the mission that they had. And the hymn goes on to talk about how this reveals what Jesus is like. So it's number 273 in Songs of uh, Singing the Faith, and it's here hangs a man discarded, a, a scarecrow lifted high, um, but also the one who reveals hope. Number 273.
Pat's going to read to us now from Jeremiah, and it's about the new covenant, not a covenant written on tablets of stone, but written in our hearts. It's about covenant as relationship, not rules. This reading from Jeremiah is from chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I shall establish a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, a covenant they broke, though I was patient with them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant I shall establish with the Israelites after those days, says the Lord. I shall set my law within them, writing it on their hearts. I shall be their God, and they will be my people. No longer need they teach one another, neighbor or brother, to know the Lord. All of them, high and low alike, will know me, says the Lord. For I shall forgive their wrongdoing, and their sin I shall call to mind no more. Amen. Good news that God will remember sin no more. Often when we talk about confession, um, it, it feels like God is outside judging us, judging our actions. Um, but the covenant of the heart reminds us that it's as much about uh, our inner orientation, our attitudes as much as what we do, and it's as much about relationship as it is about actions. And of course, we talk about confessing as confessing our faith as well. So our, our prayer of confession today is, is gonna be more about confessing our faith that God is with us and God is all around us and God loves us and renews us. And in confessing that faith, we'll think about opening up the things that block us from seeing God and receiving God's love. So let's pray. Living God, we bring you, we thank you that you bring love to our world, light to our darkness and hope to our lives. So we pray that you will give us the courage to open the doors inside us that we would prefer to keep closed. To let the fresh air of your spirit in and to blow through. We pray that you will help us let your light shine in the dark corners of our lives taking away fear and highlighting where we may need to be changed or transformed to be more in line with you. Living God metaphors and Images help us to think about our inner life, but we are also embodied people. So we pray that you will help us to align body, mind and spirit so that we may be your people. Unblock the congestion that cuts us off from you. Help us breathe freely again. Help us to let your spirit flow into us and all that would hurt and harm us flow out. Renew your covenant this day 
and help us to renew our relationship with you every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, everyone, and hear the good news. To all who turn to him, Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. He also says, follow me. Thanks be to God. I want to take us back to the John reading. Some Greeks who were up at the festival went to Philip, who was from Bethsaida, and said, Sir, we want to see Jesus. I was traveling with David Salisbury, the new, um, new synod moderator for the Wales Synod of the United Reformed Church. Um, you know that uh, you've got a new district chair in Andrew Charlesworth. Well, the new, new synod moderator is David Salisbury. And he used to be minister at Carmarthen Road and Hill down the road. And uh, he reminded me that in the pulpit at Gowerton, um, Temple Gowerton, the United Reformed Church there, is, is a piece of a card which says, Sir, we want to see Jesus. A reminder that whenever we um, try to break open the word of God, whenever we try to understand what God is speaking to us, it's about wanting to see Jesus, God's living word. Perhaps the Greeks went to Philip because he had a Greek name. Um, the other disciples like Nathaniel or, or Andrew or, or Peter, they had um, Cephas, they had um, Hebrew sounding names. Um, but Peter, the rock, was given that name alongside his Hebrew name to be acceptable to Greeks. So perhaps, perhaps the Greeks went to Philip because he had a Greek name. And Philip goes to Andrew. Andrew's the one who often brings people to Jesus. He's the one who tells Peter, look, we're Simon, we've, we've, found, we've, found, the, um, we've found the Messiah, come and see. Andrew's the one who brings the little boy with his lunch to feed the 5,000. And Andrew goes with Philip to tell him that the Greeks want to see Jesus. It's an indication that Jesus isn't just for the Jews, isn't just a sectarian leader, but for everyone. Philip's also the one who um, says to Jesus at the Last Supper, just show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. And Jesus says, have I been with you this long? And you still don't get it. And it's almost like they don't get that, that Jesus wants to be open to everybody. And so when they tell him, the Greeks are asking, he says, the hour's come. Sir, we want to see Jesus. We thought about St. Patrick at the beginning. And he wanted ways to show Jesus. Um, when he went back as a missionary, um, around Easter time, the, the Celts had a festival where um, they put out all the lights. Um, and that's the time that Patrick chose to light a fire, to show that Jesus was the light of the world and to show the risen Jesus was bringing new life to the world. It challenged the culture, but it understood the culture it was challenging. It's also, legend says, that um, Patrick put a sun disc behind the cross, a circle, um, to show that the Jesus who died is the one who brings the new dawn, new life with the resurrection. And tradition also says that um, Patrick used the shamrock to tell people that God is three in one, 
the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, the Celts had many three many things where they thought in threes and um, had pillars with three faces on them and so on. And so introducing God as Trinity to a culture which thought in threes was a way of helping them understand all of what God is. God the creator, God who is always there, God revealed in Jesus, God the spirit within three in one and that's what patrick made at his prayer i bind unto myself today the strong name of the trinity by invocation of the same the three in one and one in three i think there are still people who want to see jesus sir we want to see jesus people are fascinated with jesus but they don't think much of the church. And what does that mean for us who have found Jesus through the church, who find through the worship of singing hymns and reflecting in prayer and listening to the Bible being opened in reading and sermon, we have found God through this way. How can we communicate to people who don't want to sit in rows, don't want to listen to things where they have no right of reply or can't interrupt. Oh, you, you could interrupt, you know, we could see how it went. Um, how, do we, how do we speak to the culture around us? And because we've grown up in our culture, we don't think of it in the way that missionaries think about it, about how to, how to bring the good news of God's love into the world as it is now. When we look at the generations around us, it's clear that it's almost like a different culture. People who have grown up as digital natives with um, understanding of Facebook and social media have had their mental health damaged by it, but they've also had their, their way of seeing the world shaped by it. And it's different to the way we see it. People who've grown up with the, the climate crisis and the threat to the future of the planet have different anxieties to those of us who grew up under the shadow of the bomb and the Cold War, even though those fears seem to be regenerating now with, with Putin's war in Ukraine. How do we understand the generations around us? Their different view of participation, their different understanding of spirituality, their different approach to commitment. People will have heard me say that the younger generation will, you know, people in church think they've got no commitment. Oh, they'll run a marathon for you and they'll jump out of an aeroplane for you. They just won't sit in a chair week by week in a service to listen to a sermon for you. Perhaps for us, this is what it means when Jesus says those who love their life will lose it. Um, for Christians who were being persecuted then, or for Christians being persecuted in other parts of the world now, that might be a really live thing for them as individuals, but for ha perhaps for us it's, it's more of a corporate thing, about how we let go of some of the cherished things about our church life so that we can welcome others. Perhaps looking at the importance of smaller groups or different ways of making connections with people that it's just difficult nowadays to expect somebody just to walk through the door on a Sunday morning and connect with our worship. Perhaps we have to make bridging things that will help people to connect with Jesus, connect with the story before they can connect with us as the body of Christ in this place now. For John and for other Christian writers, Jesus is seen most clearly 
in his dying and rising, two halves of the same thing, of showing that the extent of God's love, that God would come and die for us, but also the limitlessness of God's love, that death could not hold Jesus, and that he rose again to show that love's, God's love does not die. It's one of the pictures we're building up through the cross, that uh, and it's, it's the central symbol for us, um, a cross which reminds us of Jesus suffering and dying, but an empty cross that reminds us of his risen presence with us. And in the passage we heard from John, Jesus says, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He talks not in, in graphic passion predictions, but says, if you destroy this temple, then I'll rebuild it in three days. And it was only after the resurrection that it said that, that G, the, his disciples understood that that was about the temple of his body, of himself being the place where you can find forgiveness and renewal, himself being the place where you can encounter God. He said, unless a grain of wheat dies, it can't rise to bear more fruit. Jesus used that as a symbol of for himself. And he said that when he was lifted up, he would draw all people to himself to indicate the kind of death that he was going to die. So when we show Jesus dying and rising, when we show that we are willing to let go of things that no longer help people find faith and find new ways of revealing Jesus to the people around us, then we can be a church that practice what we preach. We can be a church that follows Jesus in his dying and rising in the way that he makes for us to be with God. And we can be part of the ongoing story of God revealing himself to the world through Jesus. Patrick understood the people around him and he used images and challenges that made sense to them. Jesus used metaphor and imagery to help people grasp what he was about. We need to point to Jesus so that when people say, we want to see Jesus, we can describe what Jesus was about, who Jesus still is, and why we follow his way. May it be so. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn that we often use at Easter, but seems to make sense after the imagery of the grain that's sown to die, rising to bear much fruit. Um, I, I was remembering as well, Jesus uses that for himself, but it, it was also one of the things that um, Archbishop Oscar Romero said about himself. He said, if, if they kill me, I'll rise in the El Salvadorian people. And that's often the way he's pictured in murals. So it's an image that continues to have life around the world. So we're going to sing, Now the green blade riseth from the buried grain, wheat that in the dark earth many days has lain. Love lives again like wheat that springeth green. It's number 306 in Singing the Faith. <laughs>
Let's come to God with our prayers for others and for our church and for the world. Let's pray. Living God, when our hearts are wintry, grieving, and in pain, we ask for your touch to bring us back to life. So we pray for the needs around us. We think of those who are newly bereaved, either after a time of illness and preparation or, or after a sudden death. And we pray that you will encircle the chaos that comes with facing loss and death and all the arrangements that need to be made. And we pray that those who are going through it may know your love in the midst of it and hope beyond it. We pray for those who are ill themselves, whether it's, it's a passing bug or a chronic condition or pain that affects every movement. When it takes con concentration, um, when pain takes concentration and when people are, are dragged down with what they're going through, we pray that there will be people around with care and a word of encouragement and that your presence may be there alongside the practical treatment. We pray for those going through uncertain times because of decisions about change, whether it's changing jobs or moving house or having to make decisions because of limitations in life. In uncertainty, we pray that your light might shine through. And we pray for the different generations. Sociologists take different time scales to mark out changes, whether it's changes in technology or changes in, in the shape of the world and politics or, or different cycles of economics. We realize that the experience of generations is different generations is different to our own. Help us to discover more about how different generations see things. Help us to listen to the people we encounter. Help us to understand how they see the world. And then help us to describe the good news about you revealed in Jesus. Help us to help them to open to your spirit. And we pray about our church, the different things that are going on here. Um, the Wesley Club, the Mag Caps, the Sunbeams Toddlers, the, the, um, the Eco Group and the way that it helps us to respond to the climate crisis. We think of all these different expressions of how we show fellowship, how we show concern for your world, and how we aim to welcome people here. Help us also in our everyday conversations to help people to see Jesus. We pray about what's going on in our world. We continue to pray about Ukraine. And we pray for those in Russia who are deciding whether to protest at the election this, 
this lunchtime and whether that will be risking their freedom or their life. We pray for all those who are affected by the war in Ukraine. And we continue to pray for peace. We continue to pray about Gaza and lament the loss of life there and the struggle of people to survive. We pray that there will be ways to get aid and ways to make peace. And that there will be ways of building understanding, rebuilding the cities and rebuilding lives once the war stops. We think about the Palestinians on the West Bank and living within the nation of Israel that we don't hear about on the news but know that their lives are so affected by what's happening. And we pray about those struggling to make ends meet in, in this country. We think about those who are coping on benefits, but we also pray for asylum seekers. And we give thanks for organizations like Unity and Diversity and the Clothing Bank, which help them to, to find ways to be welcomed and to settle here. And we pray for each other in the roles that we have within the church, in being members of the body of Christ, not only gathered here on a Sunday, but active in your work in the world through the week. You know, Lord, what we need, and we pray that you will help us in the coming week to be your people and to cope with the things that come up for us. We add our own prayers to these prayers. And we gather all our prayers in the pattern of prayer which Jesus gave to us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. To our offerings of prayer, we add our offerings of money for God's work through us as part of God's people. <laughs> Living God, at the foot of the cross where Jesus offered himself for us, we offer you these gifts. And we stand to show that these are not only the extent of our giving, but with these tokens of our thankfulness, we offer what we can of ourselves to do your will. And we pray that you will give us the gift of wisdom to use this money for your work. In Jesus' name. Amen.
closing hymn is also a prayer for the healing of the nations. Lord, we pray with one accord. It's number 696 in Singing the Faith, and this hymn is one of Fred Kahn's hymns. Fred Kahn was um, minister, United Reformed Church minister in Barry, just along the coast. So um, it's a, a way of remembering our different connections as we sing our hymns today. For the healing of the nations. Patrick's breastplate is our blessing. May the strength of God pilot us, the power of God preserve us. May the wisdom of God instruct us, the hand of God protect us. May the way of God direct us. May the shield of God defend us. May the host of God guard us against the snares of the evil one and the temptations of this world. May Christ be with us, Christ above us, Christ in us, Christ before us. May the salvation of God be always ours, this day and evermore. Amen. And let's pray the grace for each other. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.